physical pressure. This is interesting part of biology. They're pushing through so many things in biology, but before they can do them, they actually have to self assemble or fold. And we really have to understand that, how that works because it's such a fundamental part of biology. Well, the second reason to study folding is that folding is also related to a lot of disease. And instead of um, folding correctly, what happens with several diseases, like Alzheimer's disease or Mad Cow or CJD, um, the protein is misfold. And then once it is folded, it becomes toxic. And so it's an interesting question just in its own right, but it has a big application for disease as well. And those are the top two things to study folding. Why do you study folding? Well, you know, it's natural to use experimental methods to study folding, but there, there's a limit, there's limitations for what one can do experimentally. And so what really emerged in the field of studying protein folding um, with us and other scientists that we collaborated with, and this was really scientists throughout the world, is to use a combination of both experiments and simulation. So you simulation to really fill in the details that one can't get from, from experiments alone. So why, uh, why use folding at home? Why use distributed computing to study protein folding? Well, it's natural to use simulations to fill in the gaps, but um, the problem is that these simulations are extremely challenging to do. It would take a single fast computer, like the fastest PC we can get now, millions of billions of days to do the calculations of interest. But instead of waiting a million days, which was of course impossible, we could wait maybe 10 days or 100,000 processes, and which is of course very doable. So what it does is it takes something which would really be impossible to do, right, waiting for a million days, we make it into something that's almost routine, like waiting for 10 days. Okay, so that was a bit of a PR. And of course this guy is not in, uh I don't know, stop it. Um, it's not the science anymore because he thought it was it was too expensive to leave in Stanford, so he had to go into a venture capital instead. So if you m want to move to. So basically, the, the idea was that you, you can simulate folding on small proteins, and you saw sort of the movement in the background there. And there are many, but it's unpractical to use for structure prediction for dark folding. So there is basically, so I, as I said, it's sort of alternative method that has been used much more lately, and sort of, at least sort of works, is what's called fragment assembly, in particular it's been highlighted by the program Rosetta and by Dave Bacon. So here is a set of protein structure predictions that have been done bl blindly in these sort of so-called so CASP, CASP assessment, CASP predictions, CASP predictions where, they, where people around the world compete in protein structure prediction so basically, everybody gets a sequence, and they should all uh, should submit a, a model of that sequence. And uh, uh, for a long time, there was basically no success at all for these targets that had no homogeneity. But in CAST 5, which must have been something like uh, 2005 or something, there was um, some success of it. So this is uh, models that were picked by the making group. So you see that all models are perfect, but some are pretty good or something like that, some are better than others. And these are models that you have, you can't really detect any homology to anything else going back. So it was clearly, it has been some success earlier, but it was mainly on small proofs that look like that, not on the little bit bigger things. And what, so what did Rosetta use? So how did it work? So the idea, if you look at it from a terrific perspective, is that sort of you have, these two forces that I talked about all the time. You had a sort of hydrogen bonds, secondary structure preferences, side chain preferences, and it was the, uh, determine the local structure of the protein. And then you have uh, these hydrophobic features that sort of add from, uh, 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 that sort of collapse from out of the polar states. But that, that brings all the hydrophobic reactions and the idea is that you can sort of separate these two problems. And they're not really the same forces, so they're not really the same things that determine them. And basically this is sort of depending on the lo local sequence, basically small small sequence area, and this other one is more to determine over the whole everything else together. And the trick to separate them is to use fragments. 
to basically um, so for each piece of sequence, and here these colors, you look for potential conformations by searching for other sequences that have the same, uh, other proteins that have similar sequence, or in any other way. So you sort of get potential conformations for each fragment of normally I use nine or three residues. So you can basically see this green one here, basically all the fragments, you, this looks like a helix, and all the fragments you find are basically helices. So I think that is the radial point that almost started to be a helix. While this red hairpin here, sort of, yeah, instead of the hairpin, but if it looks like that, or like that, or like that, it's, it's very unclear. There are different confirmations, but this is sort of like a hairpin, and this one here can be extended, but it can be more bands. So you get sort of all the local uh, many, uh, many possible local confirmations. Uh, so you have, but, but, but it's not all possible confirmations, it's still kind of limited. And for some, some reasons it's very limited because it's very strong signal that this should be a sort of amino acid, a sort of local confirmation. So you do that, and then basically what you do is that you, you keep on replacing uh, parts. You take some part here and you put in the fragment, and you take some other part and you put in the fragment, and keep on doing that. And for each step, when you put in a new fragment, you evaluate its energy function, which sort of should describe its energy, is better or worse. So if it's increase or decrease. So this uses also called kind of Monte Carlo simulation technique that people use for simulations. So it's not dynamics, but it's basically a probabilistic model of falling down this kind of energy, path, uh, energy landscapes. So the idea is then you can start stimulating here and you can get it pulled up. But so the difference is that you don't really, I mean, for this fragment insertion and deletion, if you replace fragment, doesn't follow any physical law. You're basically doing a very, very big change in one step. So it's not how, th how proteins would fall in, in, in real time, because so they, they don't move like that. But it might be a very efficient way of searching, this, searching the uh, aggregate. The other thing is well, somehow you need to compensate for water or hydrophobic effects because you don't put in water in each step here because that would take a long time. So you would have to have an implicit water model to sort of compensate your time across the water. So the models are actually quite more effective. And actually in the first step here, even you don't use all the atoms, you use a more simplified model of the, of, of the proteins. You don't have a few sidechain atoms. So you have a side general phase, but basically what you put in is the five high angles. So, uh, yeah, basically that. Take a sequence, you search the fragment library, six pages, something like that, and then use that for folding structure. So that's basically. And this is basically you do it on very low sequence similarity search. You take the same thing, the same sequence. But to certainly, if, if you had. If this was basically by a homology, you can find a very good hit on this protein itself. So you have to take a fragment from it and put it in. But this is assumed to be used for proteins where you don't have an homology, so you can't find it unless you find it as a real homologous. But there's still, of course, our preference is for amino acids to be in certain confirmations. And people develop other methods to do that, but it's, it's sort of not that crucial. Uh, but they have some rules for such stuff. You cut the fragment, you check the entity, and what are those secret entity? Yes, so important. The key important thing here is basically important is like how to develop the, pot, or the, the potential to make the energy function. And there has been a lot of incremental improvements in that. So they have been, because they have a lot of, also lot, have a lot of computer power, they can try things. But in the beginning, they had things like solvation. Often they use is a pairwise term. So basically, said, what is the probability to have an alanine and tryptophan in contact, or at a certain distance from each other? So you, you, and you calculate that from uh, from the known protein structures, and you just, you just put up a statistical model that you count how often they find an alanine and tryptophan in contact, and you might be taking into the account how many sequences residues are between them. Uh, how far away are from each other, etc., etc. 
and you calculate that and you need to have and then they can say oh it's good to have a typical typical contact but it's bad to have a, a, a nicely nicely contact and then they add some terms like the first ground pairing because they know there was hard finance there's specific terms of hydrogen bonds they have something to make it more compact but not too compact, they don't want those things to collapse, but it, should, it can be a little close to each other anyway, etc. So they, have it, they play around, spend quite a lot of time optimizing this. And they're still making new versions of it every, every X number of years. So what they do is then, they, they basically take a starting position with random confirmations, and then they simulate this for quite short times, because basically after a while you get stuck in local minimum. You can't just simulate it all too long. You basically, you start somewhere up here in this landscape, and you fall quickly down to the first, to some of these states. But if you simulate it many, you start many, many times, you sort of search a quite large area of the landscape. Uh, and uh, then you basically look, assumptions then, of course, if you look at that, is that the native state should be the one with the biggest, if you have a funnel model again. Like if you have a sort of funnel going here, so the biggest model here, it's more likely to end up here than to end up here or here. So if you have like a big funnel that drives there, you would have said that the biggest cluster would be the lowest energy state. So we will take one. So basically you do a clustering, you basically compare all the models to each other to generate uh, and you might have different sequences, similar sequences, and you, you can play around with some cutoffs, and basically there's some of the biggest cutoffs going So this is sort of how things will look like. So this, this is the, how far away you are from the native structures, so see right there, so my own, own strums and RNC, so root mean validation. And this is sort of the, the energy score. And in this case, it actually looks quite nice, because actually the energy score so the native structure is lower than anything else. This is not always the case for all, all potential functions, but in this case it is. Uh, and those also even better is that the second lowest energy is quite close. It's not the closest one, but it's the more close one. But you can see, it's not a huge difference between things that are quite wrong, and maybe here, that are six options away, then the ones are close, then the difference between these is very, very small. So there clearly are many, this, uh, so you have to look at the energies, you would not, but if you had missed a few here, you would have said this is, or this is low, low energy, and you would be completely wrong. But if you do a clustering, you would see that you have a big cluster of things here, because this one is most likely not very similar to that one. They use both six ones away, but they could be completely different six ones away. But these ones are two ones away, are going to be similar to each other. So you have a big cluster of things down here. So in this case, you see that this is native structure, and this one looks very much the same. It's not perfect, but it has things like that that are a bit big difference. It's here it looks a little shorter, but in general, right packing. But this one out here somewhere is completely different. And so this was what I said at the beginning. But in the second step, it's actually more related to pretty design is that Rosetta has what they call a high resolution requirement protocol. So basically, they take all these models, what is the best of these models, and use a more complicated energy function to calculate the energy again. By refining, you are making small changes to it and having more complicated energy function. And that's what they introduced, I guess, maybe 10 years ago. And that actually is quite, was quite useful. So basically what you do is you make small, small changes to the model. You change the heat angle or the side chain. Uh, well, some small heat angle. So you change something like one degree here, two degrees there, some random change. And then you rebuild all the side chains. So there are actually methods that are given a backbone, you can rebuild those side chains very quickly. And you can basically, if you have a native backbone, you can almost 100% accurately get the right confirmation of all the, all, all, all the Backbone in the middle of the so something sticking out of the backbone, you can have any information, but there's nothing in the middle can do it. And there are quick methods to do that. So they, they do that, and then basically that, that would mean that in a small, even if they just change the small backbone like that a little bit, two side chains can actually start to move like that. 
Och det finns ju bilder mål och det är nog kärna vad det var på. Så jag kan så det hade inte en i match bättre, you'll find it. Stöd is kind of a... Ah, kind of unique way that Rosetta uses that not other methods use. Uh, and then you keep on doing this a number of times. And they, they showed in some of these blind predictions that for five out of 60 small proteins, they got a structure that was less than one and a half ohms from the RSD from the major one. And one of the, it would say if you take two crystal forms with the same structure, they often be from one one ohms. So it's almost close to being perfect. It's like, it's not real, yeah, but it's quite close. It's almost within the, the vibrations of a proton. <coughs> so this was clearly the best method until a few years ago. And uh, uh, it was sort of worked in some cases, but it was not really good enough to uh, apply large scale. It was a bit like uh, you can apply it for some um, small protein, particularly alpha helical proteins work quite well. But uh, you have. Uh, for bigger proteins, a bit of bit of sheet was harder, and it was not really. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes not. But then, a yeah, the revolution happened. So this, to tell the story, we need to back, go back to from the years ago. But, but basically, what what, what slow show was then is basically, you can take a sequence. This is a I mean not a sequence, and if you plot this sequence like that, so the sequence starts here, it goes up here, but also from here and other. And you can con have a contact map, so basically tell you what two residues are in contact, using some kind of definition. And then, so you somehow can predict this contact map, so you can predict what two residues are in contact. So the residue 5 is contact with residue 24. So basically, if this is the real contact, and if you have nice predictions that look at that, so maybe the blue green ones are here on the contact, so that most many of them are correct. And then you can assume if you had this contact predicted, you probably could make a model. And this is actually quite similar to what you do with NMR. Do NMR. In NMR, you measure the distance between, between the well, protons or nitrogen or carbons. If you know that they are in contact, then you can make a model for this. So if you, if you could make a perfect contact prediction, you could fold up a protein. That's not so, so surprising that you could. You could use Rosetta or some other program. There are programs for, for that. But the problem was that until 10 years ago, these contact predictions were not very good. <coughs> People started developing, developing this in the 90s, but they were basically, you got 20% correct and 80% wrong. So it was not really very useful. Yeah, it was better than random. You can maybe use a bit of filtering, but it was not good enough to do any predictions. And nobody, well, very few people thought it was would ever succeed. People forgot about the problem. But what happened during that time is basically that you had a lot of sequencing. So of course, you can see this is the number of PDB entries in PDB. It increased a bit exponentially, but then it becomes almost a linear increase here from 2005 and forward, and actually has slowed down later. While the number of sequences, proton sequences, has it has followed an exponential increase. Uh, so we have many, many more sequences here. Which, but what, what is that the true structure? Well, you can look at this way. So this is if you look at the number of entries, you basically can see, well, this is. Basically, you put the same scale. Secretly, that this doesn't change at all. But you also see that PFAM, if you look at the experimental scale, you see it correct. Easter. This is PFAM, this is Uniprot, and this is PV. So Uniprot, for the secretist, has an exponential increase when this is a log scale. PFAM is basically flat. You add a few more secretists, a few more for the families. Every year, but it basically we have 15,000 families and we're not going to have them anymore later because there basically are not that many small families. Or the other families are there are very small. 
So it's not going to increase very much more. It may be covered most, unless you find some new uh, big part of this biology universal to know about, but cell physical, this 50,000 times to have covers cell functions or anything. The number of structures is not increasing exponentially anymore, but it's basically have sort of, it's not flat, but it's increasing, but it's slowed down. But the consequence of this blue and this red line is that the number of sequences for each family has increased a lot. So this is the average size of a pecan family. And for a long time it was like 100 or 50 something like that, until 2012, 2015, when the size would become 4,000. So basically for each pecan family we have a, an average of 4,000 members. Of course it's not, it's not the Gaussian distribution, so there are people families with 100,000 members, and there will be ones that only have 50. Does PEM only include really experimenting result structures, or does it also No, this is PFAM. So PFAM is basically based on sequence clustering. Yeah, but, it, okay, so. So, you say, so about half of them have an experimental result structure, half do not. Right. It depends on how you define a family, but they roughly have families. Of course, mo the ones that are bigger are more likely to have an ex uh, exalt structure than the ones that are smaller. So if you look at sequence spaces, they more, more than half. But if you look at the number of families, it's quite, quite roughly half half. So, and of course, they all increase in size. So basically, this is the information that we should be able to use. Basically, we have a, I mean, sequencing is cheap. That's what you do in the genome center all the time. It costs nothing. It costs thousand dollars per sequence in human genome. And that's phosphorus. So that means the idea. So the idea of all these contemplations we've given before is basically that you have if you have a multiple sequence alignment, and if you look at two columns, one there and one there, is that if these two positions in this are interacting, so they basically are next to each other in, 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 in three dimensional space, they tend to co evolve. So basically, uh, if one is big and one is small, and the one mutates, so the big one becomes small, then the other one is likely to become big. So we co evolution of these positions. So if you look at it in this space, so if you have, a, this is basically a small part of protein structure. And it's well packed, protein structures are well packed, you don't, you don't have a lot of space, you don't have water, things like that inside mostly. But then it happens a mutation. So this pentamere mutates to an arrow. And of course, that somehow breaks up these interactions. So it's not as favorable. And of course, nature wants to compensate for that. Of course, it can, it can mutate it back, but nothing happens. But it can also mutate something in the blue side. So you have a to organization, so you get in, so you mutate something to become a little square, to become a pentamere, and then you have a nice interaction again. So that means that because these two residues are interacting, they tend to come evolve. Of course, there's some small changes in structure backward also, but that's it. However, if you look at the other side, look up here, this has also changed. So if everything is in a network of things connected, you have you have something up here that also changes. That needs to be have another compensatory mutation to compensate for that. So everything is connected. <laughs> so if you only look at past interactions, you ignore these sort of, sort of indirect couplings. And uh, in the coffee. So basically, and this is actually a problem that was so studied for spin glasses in the 90s. Spin glasses are these kind of up down magnets, and if you have, you can think the same thing there. You have, they are all interacting with the neighbor, but the neighbor is not interacting with the neighbor, so basically, you have I mean, the two dimensions, so you have complicated things there. And you can actually solve this problem finding, basically, finding how these correlations of a pair relate to the whole coping of everything by using what's called direct copying analysis. So, so basic idea is basically you have, if you use, well, if you use mutual information, you look at uh, every pair, 
but this one might be indirect copy to other ones. Basically, this one is related to that one, and this one is related to that one, that therefore you see an interaction here that was not true. Or, so you basically you can find this, by this so-called direct copy analysis, you can find this, the, the underlying interactions that cause the correlation you see. And there was a number of papers around 2009, 2010, that sort of addressed this. Actually, there's an original paper from 1999 that's produced the same solution. There's an amount of paper from 98 also. But in those days, first, this was never really taken up by the community. And secondly, there was not enough sequence data in those days to do it efficiently. Uh, but well, so we can do that in detail, but we can look at what happens. So the, the method of correlation, one method, the other one, the better one is called mutual information. So basically you could look at the information between two columns. And if you do that, so this, this is a contact map of this protein. So this is the rest of the number from 0 to 270. And the gray dots here in the background are the real contacts. And then we can use one method here, in this case mutual information, and predict actually predict one contact for each residue. This is, the, this is about half of all the contacts that should be there. But, it, but, but you can see here, uh, and the value column, blue if they're correct, and green if it's almost correct, and red if they're wrong. And then we have a number up here that is 22%. That means that 22% of this collection are correct. So this is basically how good you were before 2008. No method is any better than that, on average. You see, you have some things that are correct, but a lot of things that are wrong, a lot of things that are very close to the diagonal and so on. We ignore everything that's between the first five rest of the So basically, if you had this context, you couldn't really pull up the structure. You see, you have some stuff here here, things that are correct, but nothing else. Then if you jump up to methods like PSYCOM, PLMDTA, the same content map, and this is PLMDTA here, you see that you have lots of patterns out here following the secondary structure movements that are correct. You don't think that are wrong here in the middle of the wall, and things like that. But you can really see that you sort of talk, that start seeing the, the interaction patterns of the protein. And if you, if you want to see it here, but you can look at the data down here. Yeah. So basically, say this region here, you don't have any contact, but you have lots of contact in here. Yes? So how I estimate what is wrong, uh, basically I, I know the native structures, I know what the correct answer in this case. So it, and in this case, we normally use the C beta atoms for eight ohms to away from each other. So basically a contact in the native structure that are with two C beta atoms that are within eight ohms is correct friction. And then I run my program and I basically get a list of all predicted contacts. I get one number for each contact pair. And then I take the top 270 ones and then you just count how, if this contact is gray here or not, and that's, that's, that's how I'm estimating if it's correct or not. And how old is the color? What? What is the classification of the color? So the, the blue is correct, red is wrong, green is, I think it was uh, between 8 and 12, 12 angstrom in this case. So it's sort of not really wrong, but not really right either. Is it uh, from the energy calculation? Or? No, this is for this prediction of the contact using this uh, this sort of this direct copying analysis methods. Basically, I, I what I do is basically I go back to my multiple sequence alignment. Here. And I calculate all the correlations between every pair of positions. And then I use this DCA method for generating uh, <coughs> an underlying model that could explain the correlations I observed. That involves like a few tricks that I need to inverse the sparse matrix and so on, but that, that's details you can skip. Uh, and so basically I get, for that I get a list of probabilities that each residues are in contact. And I just took a look at my top of this list. 
네? 
how good the method was before you had peel, uh, uh, the, the same method. This is the size of the family. So this is the, the same methods. So you can say maybe they, they are very dependent on size. Bigger families are good for Small families are really bad. This is the worst of the old methods. But our machine learning methods here, the newest ones up here, are always better. So you can combine machine learning methods. And there are actually even uh, methods that actually, so we use this as an input, but there are methods that do not use them as input that are doing more or less equally good. Particularly, they are almost they are better for small families, actually. So this, 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 this really just shows the power of how to use machine learning again. And uh, we made a pipeline, you take a sequence, you run multiple sequence alignments, you run, in this case, we run all the third generation here, you make contact maps, and we pick the structure of everything. And actually, we have a trick here, which I don't talk about, is that we have a step here, which is a model export of samples. We basically have a ma also a machine learning method that tells you how good is the model. And that sort of helps us filter away or make our prediction more reliable. Well, it basically should go from that to that. Yeah, but we want to be hard to pick now a bit more certain or correct. And we used this and we predicted at the PFAM. At the end, it picked up 500 families where we have the structure that we believe is correct that was not known before. And there's a combination of different methods to do that. And a website, and basically, this is how They basically do the same thing. And luckily, they use well, not exactly the same methods, but they use slightly different uh, methods. And I would say that in the cases we have an overlap, so they definitely also find other models, but um, uh, in the cases where we both did the same families, the models are quite similar. But there's a lot of models that they predicted that we didn't predict, uh, and vice versa. So that, that is sort of like a thousand more PIFA families you can make models for. And there are, and there are today about 8,000 fa families that have no structure. So this is the status that it was until six months ago. So we basically could make models for hundreds or even thousands of project families. And then, yeah, this is hard to open here, I heard about. I think the price of the fields. Mm -hmm. And they have a company called DeepMind, which is a UK-based company <coughs> that got famous because they uh, made, uh, uh, well, later when they made this AlphaGo, which is the, 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 the program that beat the world champion in Go. So Go is this uh, Asian uh, chess game that you that is much more complicated for, for computers than, than chess. The minimum opportunities, and you basically uh, you, they have white and black, black bricks, and you just play up on all things like that, uh, and you just turn each other's next to it. So it's, it's a very hard game for computers, but there are many, many possibilities. Chess is much easier. And they even have something called Alpha Zero, they basically, in four hours, maybe I already told you that, but they basically they have this computer and they play against itself. So it doesn't use any prior knowledge. You have to learn the, know the rules of the game. And you can learn chess or go or uh, some other games also, poker or whatever. And it plays against itself. And in four hours of training, that game is better than anything else in the planet. And it's not four hours of one computer. I'm sure they have a big Google cluster with million computers. But basically, and it's a force. Better than any human, better than any other computer. And in chess, the thing is like basically humans are very uncreative. We, we play standard and everyone don't. They play ways that we couldn't think about. So the easiest way to sh have someone cheating if you play, say, say chess game is that someone is too creative. Then it can't be a human. So, but they also then decided to put in folding for the fact prediction. And did basically the same thing as the rest of the community have been doing for the last few years. They predicted context, or actually they predicted distances. Instead of saying that two reactions should be five hours to away from each other, they should be, they had, it should be they had a distribution of distances. But that's just small modification. They have a number of small tricks that make the network more effective. 
but from what I understand, um, well, I'm sure they're important, but it, they're basically just small tricks. And this, but they also say they were very impressive in the way they worked, they were really focused, didn't have to bother about stupid things like uh, teaching or uh, writing grants or discussing with your colleagues. Or that. They had seven people dedicated and seven very smart people dedicating on that problem for two years. And they basically had internal competitions. And at the end, they made these contact maps, which are not contact maps, but distance maps. So basically, I guess this is the distance that they predict, and this is actually the real distance <coughs> in the field of problems. So you see that there are, uh, I mean, there are of course other things, but you can see, you see that there are pretty good predicting distances there in this case. And then they run this in this cap. <coughs> And then it has an algorithm, which is basically, I mean, the, the contact picture is fundamentally very similar to Pico C4. But in particular, they can make it much deeper network and probably are much better. And also, metal is converged fast. But then there's small details. And then actually, instead of like Rosetta, and the second step is basically almost like Rosetta, but they, instead of, of finding fragments, from a library of fragments, they actually use these distances to generate fragments. And then they use like a minimization for to do that. And the results were fantastic. So they did this for, for this is, I don't know which one is great. Big proteins like that, or small proteins like that. The predictions are, even for the, even for the homogeneous modeling targets, they are almost as good as anybody else. This is, not, this is quite difficult modeling one target, not easy modeling one target. Basically, for air, for in each class, they were better than the best experts in the world. The whole world was not really but they were close to the best one then. But for the more difficult targets, they were clearly better than anything else. And by quite far, far, far distance. And you see that this is quite big for the best. I think it's not hard to be clearly clear that this could be wrong. But who knows, this look might not be like that in reality. It might be textbook. So, sort of. In my mind, the put and folding problem has to a large degree been solved. So what we should focus on today is mainly trying to understand how proteins interact and other things. Yes? Uh, how do you quality control these um, <coughs> predictions? Because I mean, if you, whenever you would use a protein which was already resolved, you cannot check that. These are blind, these are the whole thing in CASP, but in the cell that is that this is blind predictions. So CASP is run every two years and there are about 100 targets that are not solved at the day. So basically, uh, and uh, they are basically, the people who organize it call around, call to their friends around the world that are working on structure and, uh, and say, what are you working on? What are you going to solve for the next two months? Of course, in theory, yeah, you could break in there, probably steal the files and do it yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but, so there are a number of examples where people actually have done that, or we're not really that, but uh, sort of used other information, you, you yeah. look at that, but in general, it, it's actually quite hard. There's a few targets that cancel like that, but, but in general, it's it's not that easy to find, because people are, people that solve structures do not want to release them before they are, uh, before they get a nature paper or a good paper out of it. So there are, sure, people could hack it. I'm sure Google could hack it, but I, I don't think it is. But, 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 but that's a really, really, I mean, it's, it's a very good point, because really, Anyone who has done a benchmark before, it's like this, you always make your method look better than this benchmark. You try to be very uh, modest and try to be do it a fair way, but it's always easy to get some kind of bias in it. So this is the, really the only way you really could show what methods work. Because there have been many people claiming that the result for the point of fault, but, other, but this is the first time they, any of these groups really have shown it on large scale in this category, and it's been running for 20 years, yeah. and this is like you I mean, it seems yeah. kind of complicated to find also around 100 proteins which are currently resolved. No, no, but there, 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 there is, what we have it here, there are, I don't know, but there are a few, the problem is 100 proteins sold every week, or maybe a few thousand every year. So there are 50, 50 proteins sold every week around the world. So it's not that, that impossible. So I mean, no, no, it, it's still, I mean, put the structure, Prediction of a production solving is a big field. There are many thousands of people in the world working on it. So, they, if you also have the right, it, it was easier a few years ago because you had this 
big structured genomics, genomics consortium, mm -hmm. a big like lab that was only solar structure, but then they have lost their funding, so they don't exist anymore. So it's more, it's more work now to do it. So it means that the type of target is shaped a little bit. But they, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they but manage it. I, I just want to say that yeah. most of the structures are somehow similarly anomaly that are reported. Most of them are, yes. So, the, the, so the, these are, I mean, some of these are, uh, I mean, but th that's why you have different categories of cats. We have like the ones that really have new folds. You, you, once they solve, you find new, not nothing structures even in the, in the database. And you have the ones that are, I mean, the ones that are, you have some variation, you have some point with that, they are ignored. They, 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 these are not easy targets. But certainly, certainly it's a work to get them, but it's, uh, I mean, they managed to get other targets, I mean, for two months or so. So, uh, is, is this going to be commercially available, or is this commercially available, or why did they build it in four weeks? Yeah, yeah, I, I talked to them, uh, it's not clear, but they, they haven't really published it yet. Uh, they, it's great that it exists, but... Yeah, it's, it's not clear what they're going to do. I think what they will do, but I don't know, is that they will probably run it through a database and present the models to the random people and present everything like that, or for a human genome or something like that, I would assume. But they don't think that even for Google, that they could make a web server that is Google quality or fast enough for them. So they, because they, they don't, like, because you're able to have something, you Google, you want to have an answer in two seconds. So they, they, even Google couldn't make that. Their methods are not extreme time consuming, but it probably it would take this. Uh, hundred hours every day or something around like that. So, so and of course you get thousands of requests if you don't manage to do it. So it's my guess is that they're gonna re re release and it probably was their method exactly yeah they can release it but it basically only runs on uh, Google internally. On the other hand one of my colleagues claims that he's better than already. So that's uh, and he, he will release his method by using the same tricks that they use. Or similar things. He was actually a third consultant, so but he was not as good as that. The, the guy in London. So, so I think there will be available methods that are almost as good, but as good in, within the next two years. They are at the moment none of it is really available. <coughs> All right, the methods that we have are available, I think that other people have their servers, web search out there, but they are uh, the good one is not at the moment. Okay. Time for next lab. Bye bye.